The appearance of the State of Israel on the world map is one of the most remarkable events in political life of the 20th century. The creation of Israel was preceded by decades of struggle and conflict. In the new episode of How It Was, we will tell you how the Jews managed to create their own state. You will learn how the world superpowers decided the fate of the new country, while the USSR, being an ardent opponent of Zionism, unexpectedly for everyone supported the creation of Israel, and why, just a day after its establishment, five neighbors at once declared war on the newly born state. The history of the Jewish state dates back to the second millennium BC. According to the Bible, Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, was bequeathed by the Jews by the Almighty himself. It is here that the main Jewish shrines are located. The ancient states of Israel and Judea that emerged in this place were often annexed by different invaders. In 63 BC, the Jewish state lost its independence, becoming a Roman protectorate. In the first and second centuries AD, Jews revolted twice against the Romans. The first time it ended with the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the Temple. For the second time, after the suppression of Bar Kokhba revolt in 135 AD, the Romans expelled many Jews from Judea and changed the name of the Judea province to Syria-Palestina, which most scholars conclude was done in an attempt to remove the relationship of the Jewish people to the region. Over the centuries thereafter, Jews periodically migrated to Palestine, but the scale was small. The first massive wave of Jews returning to the Holy Land, then a province of the Ottoman Empire, began in 1882. For several decades, 35,000 Jews moved there, fleeing pogroms in Eastern Europe and joining the 20,000 Jews already living in Ottoman Palestine. A rich French baron of Jewish origin, Edmund de Rothschild settled financial and organizational issues. This period of Jewish history is called the First Aliyah. At the turn of the 19th and 20th centuries, the Jewish communities of Europe began to buy up land in Palestine actively. They often acquired rocky, swampy, sandy areas where it was not easy to engage in agriculture. At the time of purchase, these lands were not cultivated and cost very little. But the Arabs soon realized that the Jewish demand for their land was high, and they began to inflate prices. There was another problem. The government of the Ottoman Empire, wanting to stop Jewish immigration, limited the sale of land to Jews. But the bans did not work. The employees of the Ottoman administration in Palestine turned a blind eye to these transactions in exchange for bribes. The new owners began to introduce methods of land cultivation previously unknown in Palestine, even the most hopeless areas became fertile, and Arab farmers began to adopt these practices from the Jews. In 1897, Basel, Switzerland, hosted the first World Zionist Congress, where the World Zionist Organization was established. It was headed by Theodor Herzl, an Austro-Hungarian Jewish journalist, playwright, and political activist from Budapest. He was the founder of Political Zionism, a movement designed to unite the Jewish people in Eretz, Israel. Herzl negotiated with European leaders trying to enlist their support. He met with many of them, including Turkish Sultan Abdul Hamid II and the German Kaiser Wilhelm II. Herzl sought an audience with the Russian Emperor Nicholas II, but to no avail. He did not show interest in the Zionist project. In 1904, Herzl died without having time to achieve tangible success for the future of Israel. However, he managed to convince the Jews of the whole world that it was time for them to start their own country. In 1904, the second Aliyah began. It lasted 10 years, during which up to 40,000 people left for Ottoman Palestine. Almost all of them were natives of the Russian Empire and fled from the pogroms. Thanks to the second Aliyah that reached Palestine between 1904 and 1914, a powerful campaign began to promote the kibbutz movement, agricultural communes where all participants share common property. To protect the settlers throughout Palestine, Zionists founded the paramilitary organization Hashoma in order to substitute Arab guards in the Jewish settlements with Jewish guards. The Jewish development of Palestine continued. In 1902, the Zionist organization founded the Anglo-Palestine Bank, which today is the largest commercial bank in the country. In addition, the Hebrew University of Jerusalem was founded in 1918 and opened seven years later. Albert Einstein donated all his manuscripts and letters and the right to control the commercial use of his name and image to this university. 
As a result of the First World War, the Ottoman Empire lost its power over Palestine. On November 2, 1917, British Foreign Minister Arthur Balfour sent a declaration to the leader of the British Jewish diaspora, the famous Zionist Lord Walter Rothschild, promising to help Jews build their own national home in Palestine. The phrase national home was intentionally used instead of state because the opposition to the Zionist program within the British cabinet. In 1918, the Balfour Declaration was supported by the USA, Spain and France. In 1922, the League of Nations supported the British mandate in Palestine on the basis of the Balfour Declaration. It then encompassed the region in the Middle East now occupied by Israel and the Palestinian territories, Jordan and parts of Saudi Arabia. The territories under the mandate were actually divided into Palestine, where Britain was supposed to contribute to the arrangement of the Jewish national home and the Emirate of Transjordan, created in 1921 on the lands east of the Jordan River. In the meantime, two more alias followed. The largest influx of immigrants known as the Fifth Aliyah to Palestine began in 1929 and continued until the late 1930s. About 250,000 Jews fled to Palestine to escape the spreading threat of Nazism. In Palestine, it became too crowded. The conflict between the newcomers and the Arabs was escalating. In 1936, local Arabs began an uprising against British rule in Palestine, demanding the creation of an Arab state and an end to Jewish immigration. By this time, about 450,000 Jews already lived in Palestine, a third of the country's total population. The uprising was suppressed, but Britain could not ignore the interest of the Arab majority. In 1939, the British government published the so-called White Book. According to this document, no more than 75,000 Jews could enter the country in the next five years. After that period, the immigration of Jews without the consent of the Arab community would be forbidden. In some regions, the sale of land to Jewish settlers was prohibited. In others, it was allowed, but the final decision was to remain with the High Commissioner of Palestine. Palestinian Jews did not accept the White Paper, but they still supported Britain in the war against Hitler. They understood that the victory of the Third Reich would be a worse evil for the Jews than restrictions on entry into Palestine. Thousands of Palestinian Jews fought in the ranks of the Jewish Brigade, which was part of the British Army. After World War II, Britain did not lift restrictions on the entry of Jews into Palestine. Zionists considered Britain's behavior as a betrayal and began to challenge the right of ownership of Palestine. The leading Zionist military organization, Hanganah, rebelled against the British administration joining the Ergun and Lehi organizations, which began fighting the British during the war. Jewish radicals blew up bridges and railways and organized several terrorist attacks against the British. The most notable of which was the King David Hotel bombing in 1946, where the British administrative headquarters were housed. 91 people were killed in the attack. Also, these organizations illegally brought Jews from Europe to Palestine, which caused more and more discontent among the Arabs. In April 1947, Britain called on the United Nations General Assembly to respond to the Palestinian question. A specially created committee on Palestine considered two options. The first, the division of Palestine into an Arab and Jewish state, while Jerusalem would become international. The second, creating a common state of Arabs and Jews. The first option was more suitable for the Jews, but the Arabs did not want to cede territory. The second was preferable for the Arabs, but the Jews swept it aside. In the new state, they would again find themselves a national minority. By that time, the world was already divided into two power blocks, led by the United States and the Soviet Union. The fate of Palestine was in the hands of two superpowers. The initial position of the Soviet Union was clear. They considered Zionism a harmful, semi-fascist ideology, while the Arabs were defending their homeland from colonialism. In the USSR itself, Zionists were repressed, shot and forced into exile. In the land of the Soviets, the Hebrew language was banned, although Yiddish was not. The United States feared an alliance between Arabs and communists. Some members of the American political elite believed that the United States should intercede for Palestinian Muslims so as not to spoil relations with them. At the same time in the United States, Jewish voters were much more than Muslims. 
democratic mechanisms worked, the Americans were inclined to support the creation of two states in Palestine, but they also wanted to consider the interests of the Arabs. On May 14, 1947, during a meeting of the UN General Assembly, Andre Gromyko, the permanent representative of the USSR to the organization, took to the podium. All those present thought they knew what they were about to hear, but suddenly Gromyko gave an impassioned speech on the terrible fate suffered by the Jews in the war and their need to have an independent state. No Western European state had been able to assure the defense of the basic rights of the Jewish people. The Soviet Union said Gromyko would still prefer a single Arab Jewish state with equal rights for Jews and Arabs, but if the UN Commission found this impossible to implement, there was a justifiable alternative. The partition of Palestine into two single independent states, one Jewish and one Arab. Gromyko's speech had the effect of an exploding bomb. Nobody expected such a pro-Zionist position from the USSR. Stalin believed that the military assistance to Israel would promote its transformation into a pro-Soviet state, which would help break British dominion in the Middle East. In November 1947, the UN passed a resolution dividing what was left of the British-mandated territory of Palestine into Arab and Jewish territories. The majority of the land, 56%, was assigned to a Jewish state and 43% to an Arab state, with Jerusalem under international administration. 33 countries voted for this decision, including the Soviet Union, the USA, Canada and France. 13 countries voted against the Muslim states, India, Greece and Cuba. 10 countries abstained, including Britain, China and Yugoslavia. The air already smelled of war. The plan would deprive the Palestinian state of key agricultural lands and seaports. Therefore, outraged Palestinian Arabs struck first. The Jews responded in kind. The flywheel of violence began to unfold throughout the country. The British did not intervene, and the Americans did not send their troops to the Middle East to maintain order. Jews found themselves in a minority position, surrounded by hostile Arab states with no weapons and money flowing in from outside. In January 1948, Zionist leader David Ben-Gurion sent Golda Meir to United States to collect money from the wealthy Jews living there. Nobody believed that she would collect even $10 million. Mir returned with $50 million. It was a phenomenal amount at that time, about $400 million in modern money. Now the Jews needed weapons. There were many of them after the Second World War, but it was not easy to get them. America imposed an embargo on arms supplies to Palestine. Help was offered by the communists who controlled Czechoslovakia. Its military industry had served the Third Reich, and after the war, plenty of weapons were stored there. This was Stalin's next anti-Western move. In the spring of 1948, the first machine guns, rifles and cartridges from Czechoslovakia were sent to the Jewish part of Palestine. In addition to small arms and ammunition, the backbone of the Israeli Air Force, 25 Avia S-199 fighters were bought from Czechoslovakia. It happened just in time. The situation in Palestine had become critical. The armies of the Arab countries stood on its border and just waited for the British mandate to end and Her Majesty's soldiers to go home. On May 14, 1948, at 4 p.m., eight hours before the end of the British mandate, David Ben-Gurion proclaimed the creation of the Jewish State of Israel on the territory allocated by the UN. In fact, the United States became the first state to recognize the existence of Israel. President Harry Truman announced this on the same day, but legally, the Soviet Union was the first country to recognize Israel. It happened on May the 17th. Great Britain officially recognized the Jewish states only in April 1950. On the morning of the next day after the proclamation of the new country, the League of Arab States declared war. Five countries at once, Syria, Lebanon, Transjordan, Egypt and Iraq attacked the newly born country. The army of Transjordan conquered Samaria, East Jerusalem and Judea. The Iraqi military reached Netanya. The Lebanese and Syrians took control of territories in northern Israel. Egyptian tanks were stationed 35 kilometers from Tel Aviv. 
it would seem that the situation was hopeless and soon the State of Israel, which existed for only a few days, would be wiped off the face of the earth. It was then that help arrived. On the night of May 24th, ships with Czechoslovak weapons arrived at the port of Haifa. The first four disassembled Avia S-199 fighters were delivered by cargo planes. This was the entire fleet of the Israeli Air Force at that time. The first air battle took place on May the 29th. It was impossible to inflict severe damage. The guns were jammed, but the Egyptians panicked. They did not expect that the Jews had strike aircraft. As a result, Egyptian tanks halted their advance on Tel Aviv. By the spring of 1949, Israel had concluded a truce with most of its enemies. As a result, the Jewish state retained a corridor from Jerusalem to the coastal plain and western Galilee, while Jerusalem itself was divided between Israel and Jordan. In the same 1949, Israel was admitted to the UN. It was finally recognized as a state equal to the rest. Share your thoughts in the comments and if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to press the bell icon and like it.